900 years ago, in the language of old French, the word intercourse meant trade, commerce, and exchange. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Using that definition today, it's a fact and a metaphor that all of life is a permanent, intimate episode of intercourse. And I love that idea, and I'll come back to it. We live in really strange times, and like a lot of people, I'm drawn up into digital media and screen life far more than I care to admit. And in the process, I feel like I'm losing part of my humanity. But as a photographer, I spend a lot of time looking at a screen and at a computer when I'd most like to be out exploring Orca Island and surroundings. At the same time, it allows me to create my best marriage of technology on one hand, wild nature on the other, art and science. So we all know the experience of being so smitten by nature that we're speechless. There's an overpowering, almost heartbreaking quality to the beauty of the world. Nature is my favorite teacher, and one of my purposes in life is to share what I learn. So you'll understand how shocked I was when I read the reflections of one of my students who had studied Thoreau. He said that being alone in nature was like being in a prison cell no more interesting than staring at a concrete wall. When I asked him to uh, explain what he meant, he said, the internet provided all the beauty and entertainment he needed. And it really made me think, and I thought, is Homo sapiens being replaced by Homo screens are us? <laughs> and in reply, I've created my own version of my favorite internet and computer. And here are the specs for a leaf. Operating system, life, 3.8 billion years. Memory, 700 million years. Hard drives, ancient gene pools. Downloads, vast light streams supporting life on Earth. Software, compatible with survival, wonder, and mystery. Network, massive, connected to almost every atom in the biosphere. Motherboard, the great mother. In contrast, the internet is a toddler's toy. For as long as I can remember, I have loved looking at nature from a close-up view. And as an adult, I understand why. I believe that small things rule the world. What I used to love to do at age five was to hunt after and collect toads, uh, tadpoles, salamanders and logs, and frogs. Years later, in fifth grade, I had one of my best experiences in my whole school life, spending weeks and weeks using microscopes to study one-celled animals. I was amazed at the intrigue and detail of what I found. And that sense of absolute wonder and fascination never left me, and that's why I'm standing here. Last year, I, while working on a project photographing every layer of beauty that I could find in one small area, I had that excitement, I thought, what would it be like to add scanning electron microscope images? And unexpectedly, the opportunity arose. I was able to get access to one, and I realized a life dream. Please join me on a hike across a micro landscape smaller than the head of a pin. And just remember to take really small steps. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, to a friend of many of ours, Gary, Gary Oak. <laughs> These epic, vulnerable, 
Gnarly trees are common in the San Juan Islands, but less so in Washington State. I examined the underside of a leaf of a Gary Oak, and the experience was like jumping into a lake with a mask and snorkel and discovering that I was in the Great Barrier Reef. What were those octopus tentacles? Some kind of a fungus? And the scales everywhere, and the circles and the holes. What was going on here? I felt like I was back in fifth grade. What I found here is the circles are actually the stomata of the plant. They perform an incredibly important, indispensable role for the biosphere and for the plant itself. They take in carbon dioxide and they exhale oxygen and water. I consider it one of the top five job descriptions on the planet. <laughs> Very high pay, but so unrecognized. That's why I'm talking about them here. I'm, I'm their agent. <laughs> so the scale of these images on the left, what you're seeing is one quarter the width of a head of a pin. If you take the stomata on the left, and put them together one by one. One hundred of them span the head of a pin. Have you looked at a pin lately? It's really small. So when I encounter nature and beauty in this way, and these layers and layers of fascination open up, it is overwhelming. And I have to turn to art to explore what I feel. And my favorite tools for doing that are cameras, and metaphors. So these images inspired the following poem. A leaf is a revelation. It makes breath possible. It has great skill in every gesture of heat and light, drought and flood. Take branching hairs, 10 span the head of a pin, raised to confound invaders or the obstacle maze on the leaf's belly, shards of glass atop a prison wall, or the stomata, its eyes, doors, mouths. The leaf's craft, its nano tweaks, calibrated to heat, light, and moisture, inhale and exhale. They perform the work of the world, devouring consumer soot and translating the sun's clear light into edible food. A leaf is a revelation. Its ears to the world and its mouth singing praises. I realize it's an absurd thought to say that leaves have eyes and ears and mouths, but that's not the point. It points to something more mysterious, something of great artistic, scientific, spiritual interest. These images are art and science and poetry to me. Anthropomorphizing is dangerous, but interesting. <laughs> when you stumble around long enough on the head of a pin, I mean, on a micro landscape, strange things show up. And as I hiked around on these leaves, these characters appeared. At first, I was nervous about showing these to other scientists because I thought they would dismiss them as foolish and sentimental. After all, leaves don't have faces. But there's something else going on here. There is an incredible range of work going on right now about plant intelligence, and there's no way I can do justice to that. I could suggest some articles outside afterwards at lunch. But conversations arise for me when I look through a lens, or in this case, a scanning electron microscope, and imagination lights up and things start happening, and you kind of wonder. And one of the conversations that happened here was the question of whether or not plants have intelligence. And I'll just tell you two examples that I think are pretty mind-blowing. There's so many of them right now. When an insect lands on a Venus flytrap, the plant doesn't just close its leaves. 
it counts the number of hits from the insect, evaluating whether or not it's a good investment. <laughs> Lands and you're like, hmm, too skinny, uh, too greasy. And that one's that one's not organic. <laughs> uh, too many too many pesticides. So, you know, a lot of conversations going on there. I haven't really understood them all, but that's one piece. Another researcher played a tape recording to plants of a caterpillar munching on a leaf. The plants, plants panicked and sent out defensive chemicals. And I, I ask, what is it on the plant that can hear and interpret a tape recording? I don't have the answer, but there's so much being looked at here. The favorite conversation for me that arose from this body of work is the idea of atmospheric intercourse. After my fascination looking at the Gary Oak leaves and images, I collected leaves from many different species on Orcas and, and beyond. And this collage uh, shows the stomata of 19 different species. I gotta say, each time I looked at a new leaf and zoomed in closer and closer, it was like opening a present at my birthday or something. Like, what is in here? And it's just phenomenal what comes through. What, what design, what shape, what strategy the plant is using. And absolutely fascinated me. So, the important thing about this to me, what's going on, if you add up all the work done by millions and trillions of stomata on all the plants of the world, you can get in a sense for what an impact they have in the atmosphere. They drive, they help drive the climate. And every year, all the moisture in the atmosphere cycles through stomata two times. Part of the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out right here is taken up by these stomata. And it's quite possible that some of the oxygen we're breathing in right here pass through at least one of these stomata that you see on the screen. This is atmospheric intercourse. I sent these images to another student of mine who was studying plant stomata. And he said that this image was his favorite because it reminded him of a cavern of stars. Mm. Mm, he's the poet. I like to think that there are as many stomata on all the plants in the world as there are stars in the sky, and that they're as worthy of songs and sonnets as is the night sky. And I suggest you go out under a tree with a loved one and relax there and send your breaths up into constellations and galaxies of stomata and receive their breaths in return. It's guaranteed to be romantic. <laughs> After all, what could be more intimate than the idea that our bodies are made up of each other's atoms and those of the world? If we could take in the profound beauty of this truth, if we realized that to be alive is to be in permanent intercourse with the world, we'd see that isolation is a myth, we'd feel connected, we'd have more empathy for the world and others, we'd relax. This is an invitation sent from the facts and the poetry of Stomata. I love this planet. I can't bear that people grow up without having a close connection to it. Let's not let screen life distract us from the exquisite legacy of this greater intercourse. It's free, it's eternity, it defines us. It's sufficient in and of itself. 
it restores our humanity. Intercourse, it's not what we think. It's what we are. Thank you.